Gee, that would be a party to talk about. <laughs> and I'm kidding you. No, <laughs> I, I used to not talk about it at all because yeah. it was such a traumatic, at least psychologically traumatic experience yeah. that I pushed it out of my brain. Yeah. And I didn't want to talk about it. When I would let it seep out in conversation with occasional people, they would encourage me to tell others because they thought it would be inspiring for somebody who's struggling now to realize that Joe Vitale at one point was homeless. And homeless meant I didn't sleep in a car. I didn't have a car. I didn't sleep in a house. I didn't have a house. I slept on the porches of, uh, well, wherever I found them, but often I slept on the steps of a post office because I kept hoping I would get a check in the mail or something that would save the day and turn my life around. And so I started telling the story because I want people to realize that no matter where you're at, your reality isn't as bad as what I had at one point. And whatever reality is for you, as I say in my book, The Attractor Factor, current reality will change. So let me back up a little bit. Yeah. When I was in college, I uh, was laid off every time the winters came because I was working outside, I was working on the railroad, the ground would freeze when the winters would get bad. You're originally from Pennsylvania, so yep. you know what it's like to be up there in the deep freeze. It's yep. like living in a, you know, a freezer for three months or more. Yep. It can be very horrible and you can be uh, locked into your home, not be able to drive off and driving and everything can be a real nightmare. So I was always laid off and I would collect unemployment when the winters came. And somebody whispered in my ear, you know, you can collect unemployment anywhere in the country. You just have to tell the government where you're going. And I don't know if that's true or not today. It was then. Mm -hmm. And so I packed up my bag, <laughs> no bags, but <laughs> packed up my bag and got on a bus and I went to Dallas. And the reason I went to Dallas, because at that point in the late 70s, the Dallas Cowboys, Roger Staubach, Tom uh -huh. Landry, uh, Landry, all of these people were famous. And man, everybody was really into football. And even though I'm not into much sports these days, at that point I was. And I thought, I'm going to Dallas. Dallas is the happening place. I felt like God wanted me to be in Dallas. And yeah. I went, uh, yeah, so I, I, I went to Dallas and quickly starved. I had given, and this is part of the story I almost have never told before, because people said, if you were homeless, what happened? Were you on drugs? Did you drink a lot? What, how did you, what happened to your money? I had saved a lot of money while I was working for the railroad, and a lot of money. I might have had a thousand dollars. Right, a lot and, for that time. And a lot for that time, and a lot for me at that mm -hmm. time. And so I, I took that money, and I went to Dallas, and I started looking for work. I again wanted to be a writer, but I knew I had to have some kind of job. And I knew that I could collect unemployment for a while, but sooner or later that was going to peter out. And there wouldn't be any more checks. And so I was living on the unemployment. I was trying to look for work. I was trying to write. <coughs> I was doing all of these different things. <coughs> and what I did next was I went to a company that promised to get me work helping to build the oil and gas pipelines. Hmm. If you remember from the late 70s, this was a big thing. Oh, yeah. We were building a pipeline from Alaska. We were building them in the Middle East. You can get jobs. There were, there were a lot of labor jobs. There were a lot of jobs where you'd be working long hours. But you're going to be making $50 to $100 an hour or more. And again, in the late 70s, this was totally rich. This was winning the lotto. Oh, yeah. So I gave this one company virtually all the money I had and told them, write the resumes, send them out, get me my job. I don't care if it's in Italy or Middle East or in Alaska. I don't care what it was. Just get it to me. Because my plan was bring in as much money as I could, then quit and devote my time to my writing. That was the plan. This company not only ripped me off, didn't find a job, didn't get me any kind of work, didn't get me any kind of leads or anything like that, but they went bankrupt, yeah. so I couldn't go get my money from them. And then when I tried to go to the owner of that company, he committed suicide. Yeah. So it was like dead end. My money was gone, my hope was gone, my plan was gone, my strategy was gone. <laughs> I ended up on the street. And somehow, I, I couldn't tell you how long that lasted, but somehow I migrated to Houston. And I don't remember if I took a bus, I don't think I hitchhiked, but I went through Houston. And there was a long period of desperation, frustration, and depression. Because uh, I wasn't homeless anymore. I, I had a room and a house that I paid for. And that wasn't the best, but I did have you know, a tiny little roof over my head. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I was a car salesman, I was a reporter, I was a truck driver, I was a laborer. I went through a whole series of jobs that I hated. They were miserable. The taxi cab one I always talk about because, boy, was that a mismatch for me. I was in Houston, Texas, a big boom town, and there I was trying to drive a cab. I don't know the city. Uh. You get in my car and you say, take me over to Miller's Crossing or something, and I'll go, can you tell me where it is? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> So I was a whore. I went home crying at night. I was so depressed. So uh, my um, 
And the long story short, that, that was a lot of struggle. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it really was. One thing that you uh, mentioned is how uh, the library mm -hmm. saved your life. Absolutely. The library saved your life, and you had uh, some favorite authors, Jack London, Ernest yeah. Hemingway, yeah. and there's something you realized around that that yeah. T talk about that whole, the library saving your life, about these authors and what you realized around that. Yeah, first of all, thank goodness for libraries. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, a lot of the people who helped build libraries and devoted a lot of their money, donated it for libraries. Because I, I love books. I still love books. I call myself a bookaholic. I mm -hmm. write books. I read books. I buy books. I give books. I review books. I share books. I'm crazy for books. I mm -hmm. love books. Mm -hmm. But when I was broke and couldn't afford them, the only way to get the books was to go to the library. Thank goodness for the library, because I can go in there and I can sit there and I can read the books, I can borrow the books, I can memorize the books. And one book in particular definitely transformed my life. Uh, that book's still around. It came out in the 50s. It's influenced a lot of people. Ph Phyllis Diller, uh, Liberace, a lot of famous people said this one book also helped them. And that book is The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, The mm -hmm. Magic of Believing. I've reread it probably seven times mm -hmm. since I first found it. I have collected it. I have found autographed copies of it. Claude Bristol's long gone, but uh, his books are alive and well. And he's alive and well in his books. But that really helped me wake up to, I was participating in the creation of my life by what I was thinking and what I was believing. And that was a wake-up call. It's like, who hears that when you're growing up? I mean, you just think you're a victim of everything. And I do remember going through periods of I blame my parents, I blame, I blame my culture, I blame my school system, I blame God. I blamed everybody, not taking responsibility, which is so ironic because Zero Limits, the book, the work, the weekend workshop is all about total responsibility to the extent of taking responsibility for what you do. Mm. Made vastly different than what I was growing up mm. with. And so the library definitely saved my butt, saved my life, saved my day and turned me around. And the other insight that you alluded to there was, yes, I loved Jack London, I loved Ernest Hemingway. These were strong, powerful, masculine writers. I loved the way that they wrote. Mm. And I modeled my life on them, especially Jack London. I really mm. admired Jack London, Mr. Adventurer there, the guy who wrote The Call of the Wild and White Fang and Martin Eden and 50 some other books. And at one point I realized that Jack London was suicidal, miserable, unhappy, depressed and depressing. He was a very successful author, but he was not successful at living his life. He died at his own hand. And I also remembered that Ernest Hemingway, as powerful as a writer as he was, and wrote some classic books that are considered greats of literature, he wasn't the wisest when it came to living his own life. He died by his own hand. And I realized I was modeling my life after them. I was making my life one of misery, depression, poverty, homelessness, and even considered suicide because I thought that was the curriculum. When I realized that, I realized, ah, oh, find some authors who are successful, who are happy, who are healthy, who are prosperous, who are prolific, and model them. So when I just took the aspects of Jack London and Ernest Hemingway that I admired, their writing style, and left everything else behind, my life started to change. And this is part of what I teach people in the movie The Secret, in my books like The Key is out now. I have a book, uh, The Attractor Factor is out, The Attractor Factor Field Book. Uh, the Missing Secret is an audio program coming out in a couple of weeks. All of this is focused to help people wake up to how they are actually creating their lives by what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're saying from the inside out. For a lot of people, this is the most absurd news they've ever heard, but once they get past that and they realize it's the most empowering news they've ever heard, their life can change. And that's when my life began to change, is when I realized, oh, I was making this happen myself. 